Hi, everyone. I recognize many faces. Uh, welcome. Some are, are I'm Amal Andraus, um, the Dean of the for those of you who maybe are joining us from a broader public. Um, I'm very excited to have a few of our uh, uh, fantastic uh, alumni uh, from across the programs and also our students. Just wanted to say a few words about the GSAP Housing Lab um, uh, and introduce the, the team. Um, the Housing Lab uh, was founded about a year ago uh, through a, a gift from the IDC Foundation. And uh, part of the gift went to endowing the professorship, uh, which is being held by Hilary Sample. A professor, uh, the IDC professor of design and housing. And part of it was a seed fund for the lab. And the, as a kind of research unit uh, at GSAP, it's quite unique in that there isn't a single faculty assigned to it. Uh, it wasn't, it's not like uh, the centers or even the, the other labs. It, the idea for it was really um, about uh, cross program and looking at housing uh, uh, not only from acknowledging that housing uh, today and in recent history has been very much separated um, in terms of design, planning, policy, financing, and it's very rare that all of these uh, aspects of considering housing intersect. And so it was important that the lab do exactly that, that really uh, the lab work could focus on intersecting, bringing together issues of design, issues of policy, issues of planning, and also thinking about uh, financing all at the same time, which are really the programs that are uh, represented at the school. And so um, uh, it's been a very interesting experiment uh, in that this first year led by um, IDC fellow Bernadette Berdzars and uh, many research assistants uh, um, from across the programs, uh, as well as students kind of coming in and popping in and faculty advisors um, as well from across the programs. The, the lab really defined its mission, looking at issues of affordability, resiliency, uh, transformation, uh, 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 access, um, equity, uh, to think about housing for, for the future. And so after a year of kind of defining itself and uh, being invited to the Venice Architecture Biennale, there's a kind of uh, um, small exhibition that will be held uh, in Venice uh, when Venice occurs now next, next, or is it next summer, I think, or in two summers? I, I can't, it's been postponed. Uh, uh, there is an opportunity again to, I, I'm not going to, uh, share uh, the work, but the work was really, uh, has been really interesting in looking at issues of code, looking at issues of retrofitting, you know, things that, um, um, looking at possible partnerships, etc. Uh, and, and the reason why we're holding this, this action session um, is that uh, what we found is that the lab became a kind of resource for students with office hours and a kind of feedback loop for students' work. Um, in addition to having sort of faculty advisors. And so we wanted to continue that spirit of, of openness and office hours. And to think about how um, the, the housing lab, the housing studio can intersect in new ways and specifically uh, the mission uh, and the focus for the lab uh, next year to really look at the history of housing in terms of um, segregation, in terms of uh, the kind of discrimination that is really, uh, when you think about the United States, housing really sits uh, at the center of these practices. And Bernadette uh, and Erica Song and Juan Moreno, uh, I think are gonna open up uh, ideas about how the lab can kind of become actively engaged in uh, what would be a sort of anti-racist um, housing uh, practice. So with this, I turn it over to Bernadette. I know that in the spirit of the lab's uh, experimental nature, uh, they've decided to kind of present different parts uh, 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 in different ways. And so this is really a kind of open session. Um, Bernadette, turning it over to you. And thank you everyone for joining us.
Bernadette, you are still muted if you'd like to unmute yourself. Still new to Zoom. I said it's, it's lovely seeing all of your faces. Um, I just want to say personally how lucky I feel to be a student affiliated with the lab and how extraordinary it's been over the past year to see the conversations and to have had Dean Andraus with the IDC Foundation and the school make this space to talk, to speak across programs, to operate in kind of the, the area between, um, between experiment and between reality. Um, and, and so it's, it's been a really interesting time. And I think one of the reasons for this hour is we just wanted to simply share our work and share the questions and share the, um, the, luck, the privilege that we feel that comes from being in this in the, in the lab. Um, so as um, mentioned, we, I think the work over the last um, six months in particular has really engaged very deeply with questions as it has to with questions of exclusion um, and identity and privilege and not enough putting race up front to some extent. And so in the last month, we've thought about what can we do in our ways of working in our projects and how we engage with the GSEP to make that more uh, as it should be foregrounded and understood and explicit. Um, although good work should have that embedded in always. Um, and so today we had three questions that we've been uh, thinking over and would love your feedback on. Um, you know, how can we make our work more actively anti-racist, more actively anti-white uh, supremacy, engage in the question uh, whiteness, and we want to, um, to share where we're at in these discussions with the lab team and be um, completely open to your feedback and ideas and participation and, and hopefully energy as well going forward. Um, so Juan will lead us through some of the ground rules and process for the next hour. Um, so we want to open this space and to guide this conversation with some basic uh, ground rules. First, we want this to be an open space to share and to give feedback and to get your experiences as related to the work of the lab. Um, we know that everyone will likely be coming from different places and that's why we are so, we, we feel it's so important that you are here right now. Um, we also recognize that we have, we might be opening some difficult conversations along the way. So we ask that you are gentle with each other. Uh, we're going to be talking about for about half an hour and then you guys will take the lead. So we hope you can find a place where you're comfortable, comfortable to contribute. Uh, uh, three more things. First, uh, this conversation is being recorded. So we know that May, that may be uh, daunting for some people to contribute. Um, in a few minutes, you'll be able to participate with some stickies that will be placed on along the slides. If you have any trouble editing or accessing the document, please message uh, GSN in the chat and she'll get you sorted out. And finally, here on the screen, you can see um, uh, the emails of the whole labs team. Uh, if you want to get in touch with, with us, please uh, feel free to do so. So just to practice um, with stickies, because we have borrowed this shamelessly from some of the planning students and student groups in the last that have taken place in the last month, there's a link that you can actually access and edit our slides during this session. In the chat of your Zoom, try to click on this link uh, for those of you who don't have Lion Mail, it may give issues. Um, again, GSN is on hand to try to help sort that out. Um, and add your name and where your, um, your affiliation or your graduation year. While you're doing that, I thought we'd just go around very quickly and have the lab team um, introduce ourselves so you know names to faces. Bernadette, lab fellow. Um, Juan just spoke. Erica. Hi, I'm Erica, one of the research assistants. Um, Joe. Oh, Maru, since she's unmuted. Hi, I'm Maru. I'm an Emmerich student and a worker at the lab. Uh, and I'm Joe. Sorry, I was adding my name um, and unmute. And I'm a PhD student and casual worker at the lab. Um, Joanne. Okay. 
lab. I'll just call out names. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> I'm <laughs> Jenna is here, um, uh, urban planning student at the lab. Jin, an urban planner, but with a secret architectural background at the lab, like many people seem to have have, have hidden pasts. Jezen um, is an MS Red student uh, and wonderful contributor to the lab and carrying on the work of the research assistant from MS Red, who is here this spring. Um, and I uh, don't see anyone else at the moment, but I think that's who we are right now. So great. This is the perfect segue into this slide because we can basically introduce everyone at once. Um, and like the Dean sort of summarized very um, wonderfully at the beginning, um, the housing lab was started as um, from the support from the IDC Foundation. And it was just like this really incredible experience to be in one space, one physical space initially. Now, of course, we're all online but one space where it, it is completely interdisciplinary um, and it is student facilitated. Um, so it's a place where people from the various programs can come and sort of discuss different projects that they're interested in, but also share ideas, um, information, resources, et cetera. Um, so this year, the lab focused on um, sort of the existing housing stock in New York City, particularly walk-ups and new lot tenants. Um, and here you see sort of the people who are involved this summer, but um, there's a growing list of um, faculty and student alums, as we're calling them, um, who are part of Housing Lab. And I'm sure in the many years to come, like, this network is just going to um, really strengthen the way that housing is sort of discussed at GSEC because people believe and do various things in the industry, et cetera. And we're hoping that um, there will always be a tie back to Housing Lab at the funding. Excellent. Yeah. So, did you have something to add? Oh, okay. <laughs> so as we looked at the existing housing stock this year, um, we looked at it from various scales. So sort of from the smaller scale architectural interventions um, that related to code and zoning changes to the financial feasibility of these, and then um, sort of zooming out and looking at the area networks of particular neighborhoods that have um, a more dense concentration of these walk-ups and uh, remote tenements. Um, and then even looking at sort of an operational standpoint how some of these new law tenements are run, if let's say there's a co-op living in them. And um, through our research, we found that uh, new law tenements, so new law tenements are basically buildings that were built between 1901 to 1929, roughly. Um, and they sort of represent this moment in New York City's history where there was a big um, innovation in the way that zoning um, gave basic amounts of light and air and increase the standard of living for people in the city. So we wanted to tie back to this very um, influential moment in New York City zoning history. Um, and we found that the New, York, the new law tenements sort of serves a disproportionate amount of people who are living in overcrowded situations. Um, they're home to a large percentage of the city's black and um, Hispanic populations. Um, so this is one reason that we found that uh, studying these buildings could potentially have greater impact across the city on kind of an incremental scale, um, as opposed to sort of proposing, you know, like raising buildings and building completely new. It's like, how can we tie back to all the stuff that already exists in people's homes? So we'll just very briefly summarize, you know, one slide per sort of booklet. Um, what you see here are the covers of four booklets that basically piece together and become like this puzzle set of the different ways that we looked at the so this first slide is just like a snapshot of how we looked at building interventions to new law tenements. So um, there are five different intervention proposals um, ranging in uh, focus. So some of the proposals have to do with adding increasing density at an incremental scale. So what you see here is rooftop additional units um, being added on um, and the, the zoning building code um, that currently inhibits this from happening. So we actually went through all of these codes uh, bylaws and sort of uh, highlighted the things that are not allowing it to happen. And currently, this document is out for peer review. And the other interventions, so this one deals with density, but the other ones might uh, or deal with um, sort of raising the standard of living, so giving people outdoor space or making the, the buildings more accessible by adding elevators uh, or changing unit types to convert from typical one to two bedroom units um, to SROs. Just to add on to what Erica said, I think it's kind of astonishing that many housing centers of housing innovation don't look at existing building stock, which is where many poor 
um, people live uh, and unsubsidized stock. And so we took, tackled that as a way to engage with kind of the dual crisis of climate change and affordability thinking, how can we increase just really basically the resiliency access and inclusion of places that people already live in generally good locations for buildings that house low and middle income people and taking on the walk-ups of New York City and then taking the slice of the new law tenements in particular. And um, also just a shout out to Erica, this is thousands of pages of code that they've read to identify these these um, things. And as we're peer reviewing it this week, my one hesitation is everybody wants to, to own this and to take it from us and to get it, to, to make it go forward. And so there's a, a, an immense amount of excitement. So just to, to shout out to that so far. Um, and so we, we tied some of these building interventions to uh, financial feasibility studies, which uh, Jill yeah, so the goal of these um, financial feasibility studies was to see how we can ensure affordability um, in this new law tenement stock that meets city's uh, AMI levels without actually relying on federal programs or sub subsidies like LIHTC. Um, so using this like six story new law tenement building as a case study, uh, we looked at two scenarios. Scenario one would be looking at the rooftop ADU units. Um, and scenario two, we looked at the conversion of a typical floor of one two bedroom units uh, to an SOR co-living arrangement. And so this increased unit density in turn um, facilitates lower rents for all of the units in the building, uh, which helps maintain a healthy return for both an outside investor um, and existing building owners. Mm, all these ideas that we just heard make a lot of sense uh, at a scale and knitting together the buildings for interventions in bundles that perhaps can enable uh, this financial feasibility as a well to us unlocking capacity for shared amenities has been another one of uh, our topics for research. We are producing uh, area plans for resiliency and that identify priorities within low income communities. Uh, as well as spaces or amenities that could be supported by networks or buildings along uh, public spaces and with both private and public funding. Um, and finally, uh, we have been looking at the operational structures that support innovation in housing that doesn't receive a lot of uh, subsidies in the city, which is uh, rare. New York City, specifically in the HDFC model, has example, examples of experiments in limited equity and limited income housing. And we have been doing, uh, we, we have prepared a white paper that's hopefully will be published soon, uh, where we study and extrapolate from the success and failure of, of this model uh, from the past uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, to look at its organization and the maintenance practices that have helped these buildings to stay afloat. Bernadette, you're muted. I should I have a loud child in the background. But I should say in all of these, um, they came about through conversations with practitioners and were developed very intentionally through partnerships and through conversations with folks in practice. Because the question is, how can we use the energies and use the expertise of programs across GSAP to do things, to change, not just in addition to changing discourse and how we learn, but to engage with the actually existing built environment and the actually existing world of design. Uh, investment and policy. So um, we've been in conversations for those previous parts, in particular with Chaya, UHAB, and Sidewalk Labs, um, a nonprofit that's closely affiliated with the city, a community-based nonprofit, and a, a new developer that has tech funding. So across the spectrum, and now we're also in conversation with, with folks um, who do zoning and code in New York. Um, and so to pivot a little bit to, to right now, we at the lab have been talking about how can we um, how can we work better? How can we make sure that the ways that we enjoy working together and that feel productive are formalized? So we've had a series of conversations about ways that we can make sure um, to to keep being and to be to be even uh, a more reflective, 
more inclusive, more welcoming, more safe, uh, more critical space. Um, so these are the these are the working uh, working working things we have now. I know that some of the terms are kind of insider terms that we've talked about at the lab. But what we'd really appreciate in the next slide there are stickies. So if you're able to edit the document, put in ideas of things that we're missing, what we've left out, practices that you've experienced in your own workplaces or own lab settings that we might be able to incorporate or think about. Um, as we go forward, both in the projects and the process that we have and also in our own internal team. Um, Erica, you were going to talk about a few examples of these too. Yeah. Um, so while we were sort of writing down our methodology or our ways of working this week, um, we just wanted to write them in very simple terms. And I think the first one kind of ties into that. So when we talk about race, um, we want to be a little bit more direct when we talk about it. So we don't want to dance around the issue because housing is so tied to sort of systemic racism in the city and or everywhere. And it's really a physical manifestation of these racist structures. When we talk about it, um, we really just want to be upfront. To be honest, we don't really know how that works. And I think that's part of it. Um, it's part of uh, probing each other when someone says something that isn't quite clear to sort of get to um, the nitty gritty of what we're talking about. Um, and of course, Talking about these things also require practice, and I think Housing Lab is supposed to be a place where we can practice talking openly and very clearly about these issues. Um, and point number two um, comes from a book called Minor Feelings um, by Kathy Pong Park, where she identifies minor feelings um, as sort of like negative emotions that are built from, she calls it, the sediments of everyday racial experience and having one's perception of reality constantly questioned or dismissed. So I think many people can sort of relate to this feeling where um, in your everyday encounters, you experience things that um, experience racist things or witness racist things that um, might not seem like a big deal, but at the same time sort of build up and the sedimentation of these things are, if, they, if they're not addressed, essentially they become sort of these flashpoints. And uh, we want to address this in Housing Lab as well within our discussions and the topics that we approach. We want to make sure that minor feelings are major and we um, are able to sort of call out these things um, rather than let it pile up. In our, in our ways of working also just kind of logistically, something that we've already been doing in the lab in the spring, but that we want to continue and formalize is making sure just very basic good stuff like ways of working. We post our job announcements for casual and hourly workers, circulate it to all the students, have a transparent selection process. The four of us um, who started were nominated and interviewed uh, by faculty and program directors, but in forthcoming years, it'll, um, there'll be applications for the casual workers. That's been the case. We have been tried to be very transparent and open with the student community about what we're doing and how to be involved. And then perhaps, I don't know, at least for me as a you know, former practitioner, current practitioner, most importantly, to make sure that the ethos of working is one that respects um, the folks that we're talking with as co-producers who are completely, um, if not much more, almost certainly much more knowledgeable about their situation and their housing than we are. And so to operate from a point of humility, but also understanding exactly what we bring to the table and how we can help and be forthcoming about that. Um, and then inside of our team, you know, making sure that we uh, listen to each other. And this list is from everyone. <laughs> and it's still very much in progress. And one of the interesting things to me, kind of from a disciplinary perspective, I'm going to skip over this slide, but please add and edit and comment and push back against us if we're missing important things, is how we keep circling back to narratives and stories as something that links us together across disciplines. So in um, early in the spring, as we were thinking about overcrowding and in unsubsidized spaces, we started writing little shorts from folks at the lab about their family members, about people they knew living in overcrowding, overcrowded housing or sharing spaces and how precisely the audio privacy of, you know, of walls was negotiated, how, you know, sync turns were, were managed. And so something we've been doing um, along in that spirit, and we would love for all you to all of you to contribute. Our question this week is, what has been our experience with race in housing or working on housing as experts and as practitioners in the built environment? Whether it be in a team, whether it be in the language we use in a project, whether it be the expectations that people have of going into a certain place um, and so forth. So we have started writing those or sharing them um, 
And at the end of this presentation, we have stickies. We probably won't have time during this hour, but we really invite folks to add to them and to stay afterwards if they'd like to or to reach out to us on the email addresses um, later because we found that these narratives fit with our mission at the Housing Lab of engaging with the nuance and heterogeneity of experiences of people in their homes and in their neighborhoods that's often overlooked, we think, by design and by policy and by development. So the shapes of houses don't match. The neighborhoods don't always match. Um, the ways that building and finance and planning happens doesn't reflect the broad range of lived experience. Um, and so this comes back and enriches, I think, our own work and methodology. Yes. So on to things that we're going to do in expansions. And this is very preliminary, um, but we wanted to share with you because we're excited about it. And we see it as continuing and expanding our work. Maru. Yeah, so we're in the initial exploration stage of what mixed income communities look like. And because Manhattanville is so close to us as a Columbia um, community, we want to focus on that neighborhood, not really as an institution savior, but really work with the community and figure out what housing needs and what small changes or proposals can, can work really to, to have a closer tie to the Manhattanville neighborhood. Juan? Yeah, I just want to jump in to, to add a very specific thing. As you all probably read in uh, On Learning Whiteness, the letter, the letter published by uh, GSAP's Black faculty, um, Colombia needs to really address the damage it has inflicted upon Harlem and start to repair it. And I believe there's, there's a question that we got in the chat that aims at these uh, sort of processes. Uh, so for us, working with Manhattanville is just the first step in the lab's vision to conduct uh, these principles that we have stated uh, previously for anti-racist work. Yeah, so really focusing on the neighborhood beyond um, Colombia's presence in the neighborhood, but really um, focusing on what housing means for the community and the people that live there, what the overlooked stories are. And we have an example of the East Harlem neighborhood plan that's shown in the slide that can help as a precedent into looking, into making sure that Manhattanville stays a mixed income neighborhood and doesn't slowly trickle into gentrification more so than it is already. And I should say, I think, um, to add on to that, you know, our approach is we don't want to be students who are just using the time and resources of community organizations in Manhattanville. So we're starting out by saying, here's what we've been working on, uh, existing housing. We have some really exciting and detailed and you know, dozens of pages long uh, examinations of what could unlock more development on existing buildings um, and make them you know, strategies to continue and expand affordability there. But um, to talk with folks who are there and say, you know, we can draw, we can make maps, we can write. What are you working on? Is there some small way that we could contribute? We are not going to be able to change Columbia's relationship to Manhattanville. We're a small group of students, but we wanted to see if there's something very modest and very humble that we could uh, and start a conversation and, with, with the understanding that there's decades of mistrust. Um, there and so to to do so humbly and I just want to thank Dean Andreas for providing some really great introductions and support for this work. Um, you know, she's put us in touch with Maxine Griffith, who's then put us in touch with folks who are working in the neighborhood. And I think I think it could be tricky, but I think we're going about it in the right way, slowly um, and being very transparent about what we can do. And we'll see if it works, and maybe it won't. So the other, um, another conversation that's come out of the lab in this month um, has been thinking as, as Dean and Drauss, and we mentioned in the beginning of the call, kind of the way that the lab has served as a space for all of us to learn and to have critical discussions around housing and how can we share that um, with more folks at GSAP and in particular our student peers. Erica. Yeah, so um, in the second year or the third semester of the MARC um, studio sequence is um, Housing Studio. And this is a decades long sort of tradition at Columbia. And, you know, it's just like the, the amount of work and the type of exploration that comes out of the Housing Studio is incredible. 
And like Bernadette just mentioned, we thought this would be an incredible opportunity to sort of expand the resources of Housing Lab to not just within Housing Lab itself and its immediate circle, um, but also to the housing studio. So how can this sort of be an overlay on top of the design? Um, that is the design exploration that's happening. Um, so right, we, we met with the faculty last week and we're sort of um, developing ways that we can provide resources for the core three students, um, the housing studio students, but also um, resources that can then be expanded to the rest of the school, to the community, et cetera. Um, so what you see down below, the four black boxes are sort of the, the main objectives that we want to plan for. Um, the first two being a little bit more sort of uh, uh, products. So the first one is a list or a series of lists that are sort of broken down into different buckets of housing and categories. So housing and intersectionality, housing and the legacy of white supremacy, housing in light of COVID-19, which is, you know, we're all going through it and experiencing it personally right now. Um, so the reading list would incorporate not just books, but also um, recent articles, thought pieces, et cetera. Um, one thing we are questioning is, do we really need another reading list? There are so many reading lists out there right now. Is there a way that we could um, contribute to what is already out there by giving an additional filter um, through the lens of GSAP? Are there faculty, um, alums, et cetera, who have done work um, relevant to these topics that we sort of um, highlight in the beginning so to sort of reinforce that um, work that's already been done? And then we can then tie into um, all the other stuff that's out there. So the reading list is one aspect that we're thinking of and um, it would be available online um, as a series of hyperlinks. Um, and then also terminology. So terminology personally is something that um, was a great surprise for me when I first started at Housing Lab, something that I didn't expect to make such a big impact. But I think even just learning terms from the other disciplines, like I had no idea what AMI was, I'm sad to say, before I started at Housing Lab. And now that I know and I fully understand or somewhat understand, um, I can engage in conversations with people in housing and real estate, et cetera. Whereas previously it would have been sort of this um, a barrier. So having, um, again, maybe it's a hyperlinked uh, glossary that um, not only defines what the term is, but then relates it to resources um, that people can then um, choose to um, explore further if they wish. Um, and then also we were, hoping to have a series of weekly conversations um, that would, wouldn't just be for the housing um, studio students, but could be open to the whole school for alum, et cetera. Um, Bernadette, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure, yeah, at first we had an idea to do one, and then we thought we'd do them monthly, and then all of the team and the students we've spoken with have said that they need to happen weekly. We're stopping here, we can't do more. Um, we're a small team, but what our thought was that Everybody wants to learn these days. Some people learn through reading in this. Other people, like myself, learn through listening often. Um, or I mean, most people can do both. Um, and we have a lot of amazing expertise and folks who know things at GSAP and in our broader alum community and professors. And so to have um, an hour every week dedicated to a short, but different, open to different formats, co-facilitated by a student at the lab and a guest. Um, so that can be you. Um, one of you, uh, many of you, all of you, um, around topics that we and you on this next slide can propose. Um, and so that's really where we want to spend the bulk of the remaining time is to think about how best to we can use our time in preparing and carefully facilitating these sessions um, to be useful to, to you all and to be interesting. Um, for example, something that came to mind for me, um, I have a, a uh, there's a, a student in the planning PhD program who knows a ton about redlining and Professor Mario um, Gooden also knows a lot about redlining. I would love to hear from them a compressed history of 10 minutes of redlining and then be able to have a conversation in which people can ask ignorant questions, good questions, hard questions, put them in conversation with each other, not in um, a way they, they are both experts and they could both give formal presentations but in a, in a format that is more like a conversation. Um, so those are, that's where we're at now, but we're also open to other ideas, how this format could take place. Um, and we're aware that everything we do and the structures of how we do things often uh, just reproduces 
bad ways of, of, of working and of being and of exclusion. So please, uh, let's be inventive together. Um, and then um, one thing that we didn't mention also just to, before we go on to the next is that in conjunction with the resources um, and kind of an you know, open list of where GSAP's thinking has been and where good starting um, uh, designs have, have lived um, is that we'll host open, uh, open office hours for this fall, just the core three students, but maybe going forward in the spring as well to be a place where folks can come with specific questions about their projects and um, get ideas on, on where they might turn to next, or perhaps most importantly, and this is something we've, that's happened in the lab anyway, accidentally, is, oh, you're working on X. Did you know so-and-so in MS Red is also looking at X? You know, there are two students looking at very similar things across different programs and so connecting them. And I think being able to harness that uh, power across GSEP will lead to some interesting stuff. Um, so if it's all right with you all, um, we wanted to jump ahead and just have a mad collective sticky editing session. I admit I'm a planner. This is the best we can do, we have ugly stickies on Zoom. Um, but we would like ideas for topics. We would love for you to, and you don't need to put your name or uni next to them if you'd like to be anonymous. Also keep in mind, we have a linked document to this if you'd like to open it up and give us critique on this session as a whole, how it's run, we'd love that. We know it's being recorded, so this would be a space where you could put feedback for us, how to do this better next time. Um, but on the stickies, topics that we should cover uh, ways of structuring the conversation, and even better, if you'd like to sign up to co-facilitate or co-lead a session with a housing lab student, or just you know take it away with someone else, and we can turn over our space and mic and um, wonderful students to you for the week. So. If you also have questions about housing lab specifically, because um, I know people have various reasons for why they wanted to join the session today, please feel free to speak up. Um, we would love to hear what your interests are as well, and how we could collaborate this yeah, upcoming we, semester. We know that some people write best in silence, but we thought we'd try to do writing and introductions at the same time because we're compressed for time. So if you can uh, feel comfortable, unmute yourself, say why you're here, and some of the thoughts or questions you have, that'd be great. And also edit the stickies while you're at it. Um, and I admit I'm, I'm, I'm being hypocritical. I can't edit the stickies without stopping my screen share. So I, I hope that it's happening. But um, so I'm Bernadette um, and I'm a sixth year, almost done uh, urban planning PhD student. And I'm here because and, uh, I love working with the lab and it's also, uh, I've realized how um, I've lived in rural areas that have been really segregated. And I've often, I grew up mainly um, in the uh, black side of town in West Virginia and in Texas when I was little and how I didn't really understand what made it that way. Bernadette, I wonder if you could actually, um, instead of doing the presentation view, you could actually just show the screen um, and then we could go through some of the suggestions that have already been posted on the stickies. Oh, because it won't, right. Yeah, okay, it, it sure. doesn't live update, yeah. I actually have the, the slide open. I could, we could switch, switch to my share so that Bernadette doesn't have to find the, the Oh, okay. Paper. Oh, I didn't realize it was, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll, okay. I'll stop Thank and you. we'll see yeah. it from Lila. I'm going to channel my professor uh, self and start cold calling people to introduce themselves unless someone unmutes. Right. Um, oh, sorry. I do have one thing that I wanted to say. Um, if there are any students on the call right now who are entering core three and um, would like to be involved in sort of curating the, the uh, resource list that we'd like to put together for the core three students, like please reach out to me. Um, I'd love to work with you and also get your thoughts on what you're expecting from Housing Studio. Um, it's kind of like this big um, 
moment in, I guess, a GSEP students, GSEP MRC students uh, time. <laughs> so I think it would be really interesting to discuss it before Yorkshire start the semester. Well, I'd like to add a couple of things. I am, my name is Victor Body Lawson, by the way. Um, I'm an architect and I do a lot of affordable housing projects. I am working with, um, I do um, old law and new law tenement projects, renovations of those, and also new construction affordable housing projects. And I realized in working with that, that it, it's two different realms. In other words, the people who handle new construction at HPD, Housing Preservation and Development for the city, and the people who do renovation of old law tenement projects and new law tenement projects have two different mindsets in terms of their approach to um, the product that is, is given back to the community. I think what would be good is for the housing lab, after you've done all of your studies and come up with your suggestions, is to meet with, um, say, HPD, with the you know, renovation group, and sort of talk to them about what your findings are. I'll give you an example quickly in that um, when we approach uh, renovation projects or rehab projects, the attitude is to pack it in as much as possible with very little um, amenities and just give the same number of units that the buildings had initially um, to the new renovation. In other words, I've got a project that we're working on. It's about 70 apartments. There were 70 apartments in the building originally, and they asked us to redesign the project and put in 70 units. That doesn't make sense, right? In other words, you've got bigger bathrooms, bigger kitchens, you want to put in amenities. You know, the old law buildings were designed poorly. So when you try to convince them that it just doesn't work, um, you come against some kind of resistance. So I think it's important that you affect policy, you know, to try to do this work, you know, in a vacuum, and I'm sure you're not doing it in a vacuum, but to do it without affecting policy and the mindset of the people who are, who've got bean counters asking that we have to have 200 units of housing, regardless of the quality of the housing is an issue. I think the, the, the new, um, ground up construction um, branch of HPD, EDC, and all of these other agencies have a totally different mindset. And I think um, if we could get the housing lab to affect policy in terms of all of the things that you've talked about, I think it would be a great thing. You need to engage them more um, in, in the work that you're doing. Help us engage them. Help talk to us. Let's sign. Uh, that would. I think that that's such an excellent. How, how can you engage them? Was that the question? Oh, I said uh, that's that's exactly our mission. Yeah. Can you help us? Um, of course, absolutely. We we'll, just need to call them. We need to meet with them. We need to show them. It would be great to get a, uh, you know, say for example, a project goes out. You get that. Get you know, if if HPD is working on a project, get the housing lab to review the project based on some of the issues that you've talked about. So you could say, okay, we need more. Um, we need a daycare. Um, we need um, we need laundries. We need um, more light and air. We need um, an ability for people to have ownership of the buildings. We need to figure out how, as the systems age, you know how they will be replaced or how they're going to be maintained by the tenants if they own the buildings. Or we need for HPD or whatever agency, it should have some kind of a plan for maintaining systems, because that's the biggest problem. When you have boilers that shut down in the middle of winter and there are no resources to replace those boilers at that time, or um, it, it now starts to take away resources from other projects, then that becomes an issue. So I think, again, from the racial standpoint, ownership is very important and income 
income that's commensurate to the growth of the buildings, the growth and aging of the buildings, and and it is very important to to um, racial equity or social equity or demographic equity. I think without that, it's where it's going to come back here in 25 years, and you know we're, we're doing the same thing. I see. Um... Professor Sutton has her hand up as well. I just want to say also that we are a small lab, so while we want to do change, we have to be start small to some extent. But yeah. yeah. First of all, I want to congratulate you uh, on your uh, just the whole way the team is working together, your collaborative process, the democratic principles, the idea of listening, of being kind to one another. I, I think that you have established a wonderful way of working and also the idea that you're going to focus on a specific neighborhood that's nearby and in particular looking at gentrification. I want to put something on the table, which is I think you have to consider a little bit what your assumptions are, your beginning assumptions are about what is housing. Housing is a main way that the dominant society reinforces itself, reinforces its values. And we've had two major, uh, major uh, threats to those values. One is the virus in which this idea that housing is for living and you go someplace else for working and to go to school and all of that is now, you know, it's in question. And then George Floyd's lynching brings into question the whole idea of how housing has been used to oppress black and brown people. So part of your work and you know, some part of it, I think, should be maybe working on two tracks. One that accepts housing as it is, housing, you know, as we know it. And you go to these agencies and you try to work with Manhattanville and do some very practical things. But I think another part of it has to get out of the box and say, what is housing in the future that would be more democratic? that would not be strapped into the white patriarchal society. The form of housing has been a tool of oppression. And to question that, because in between the questioning of what is housing and then working very specifically on housing as it is given in today's society, I think you'll create another space for innovation. Thank you. We started this spring from kind of a point of being angry that housing is beyond the unit um, and the way that it's conceptualized just is, yeah, as, as you said, is wrong. And now, as you said, there are these two moments that, uh, that open the conversation more broadly at a society that we need to, we need to move quickly and boldly in. Um, so can we ask you for help too going forward? Can we? Besides, we've all been here. absolutely. I mean, my answer to your question is, uh, what what has been your experience with race and housing? It, I wouldn't be an architect if I hadn't grown up in discrimination. I got to be an architect, finding a way to get around racism. That's how I got to be an architect. So yes, I'm on your team. <laughs> My name is Cecily King. I have a comment. Um, I actually included it in the chat because I can't access the document, but it is similar to that idea that you just said about um, uh, thinking about housing as it is today and how it should exist potentially in the future or some being, being a bit more dreamy about it. And this is slightly practical, slightly dreamy. Um, I have a unique position of being from the Northeast. I'm from New Jersey. So I've grown up, you know, in New York. I have family that lives in New York. But 
professionally, I've worked around the country. Um, and so like the typology of housing is very different around the country than necessarily in New York. Um, and I know obviously GTAP has a New York focus, but just thinking broadly for a second, um, one, there's two things I struggle with. Um, when we talk about affordable housing, and I work in affordable housing, I have worked in affordable housing, um, is the idea of affordable housing being an end condition versus an option on a spectrum of housing options. Um, I think it's something that's definitely necessary. Um, and, but again, an option and not just an end all be all. Um, and to that point, I think one of the things that troubles me when we talk about affordable housing is the need for it exists because of wealth and equity in America. And that for me is literally tied to race. I'm a black American. And so there's, there's a lot of different layers to that conversation for me. Um, so for me, rentership, the word like white patriarchy and like the, the white system, I'm, I'm a real estate developer. So like the world of whiteness and real estate development is inherently one of ownership that people live in places that are owned by someone else. Um, and that I, one of the things that I challenge as a developer myself is this idea of ownership. Um, yes, it's a little bit different for me to be a black woman property owner, um, which makes it a little bit more palatable. But at the end of the day, I'm the owner of where someone else's home is. And so what does it look like to think about the transition of that as like a normal notion for you to not necessarily own the place or have an even any type of ownership stake um, in the place that you're living, um, affordable or otherwise. So, um, the lab was really privileged to host uh, Mark Norman earlier this spring, and I don't know if his lecture was available online, but uh, he engaged really directly with uh, race and ownership and ideas of co-ops or limited equity as being both useful and also, also perhaps very problematic in terms of limiting the amount of assets and household wealth um, that's been um, so unequal in this. Just to add to what Cicely just mentioned, if you look at it, most people, particularly black people, um, are warehoused in, in wherever they live, particularly those that rent. If one could think of housing and ownership, and you use housing for um, to socially and economically raise the quality of lives of people so that they can at some point be able to even sell their units after they've lived there for a long time. You've just transformed them from one demographic, economic demographic level to another. That's empowering. So I think it's very important to look at ownership and look at housing, affordable housing and ownership as um, equal uh, levels. Because once that's done, you can essentially improve the lives of people who would otherwise be disenfranchised or who would live from point A to point B in time. And at the end of the day, they're still in the same position. Just a quick um, housekeeping, it is 1159. Um, some of us, many of us at the lab team are happy and would love to stay on. But if you do need to go, we want to be respectful of your time too. And thank you to those who were able to come today. And if you haven't given us your email addresses, Zoom is weird, we can't circulate a paper sign up sheet to, to harass you later um, with, but please uh, write us in the chat or put it there so we can, if you'd be interested in, um, being reached out to from the lab and being included in our events. And Jezen, just put a sign up in the chat box as well to have, let us have your contact information. With that, I don't want to interrupt. Let's, the, let's let the conversation continue among those who can stay if possible. Yes, hi, this is Mark Box. I'm an alumnus of the Urban Planning Program at Columbia. I have to jump off now, but it was a pleasure to be part of the, uh, the session today. And so I left some comments uh, in the chat room. Hopefully you'll get to uh, look at them and um, hopefully they'll, they'll add to some of the uh, research you're doing in housing. Um, but it's been a pleasure, so 
thank you all for uh, hosting this, this session today. Hopefully, I'll be able to be a part of future sessions. Thank Take you care. so much, Mark, for all of your comments. We'll definitely add these to the stickies as, as we go. Thank you. Any current students? One other question that we've been struggling with at the lab is how to engage um, your ideas going forward. And the only ideas that we've had in this time of Zoom are emailing with a uh, call to respond. We don't like surveys. But what are things that we can do to gather your um, opinions and feedback that aren't email, especially for current students? Or if any folks want to continue on, um, the bigger conversation, that'd be really great too. I just, my mind is always full of logistics. I think maybe like a, another Zoom session with current students could be helpful just to discuss it. Cause I always feel like having a dialogue is much more productive than like inputting what I think and then like hoping somewhere it like goes to the people that like change it. <laughs> um, so Zoom call would probably be productive. And I know that like a lot of current students would be open to joining it. Needs to be Professor Sutton's comment in the chat box. One of the questions we've been struggling with at the lab is how bold to be and how big to be and how pragmatic and grounded to be. Um, I think if there's one thing we're hearing today is we should be bolder. Um, I have a question. Um, are you looking, is the housing lab looking at um, current pro projects that are going on around the city right now? Or are you looking at other models of um, housing projects that are in the pipeline? Benedict, is that, I guess that's I'm waiting question. for someone else from the team. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, <laughs> well, I'm trying to remember if, I don't think we've actually looked at ongoing projects, although at one point we did discuss, like, it would be incredible to compile a list of all the uh, affordable housing projects going on in the city and really analyze them in an architectural sense to see, like, how many of these, like, how separated are these units? You know, you have, like, a horrific poor door scenario where there's just like a completely separate entrance. How have they been designed? Um, I know that there was a document uh, from, was it DCP? I think Justin Garrett Moore was part of creating that document um, recently about affordable housing in New York City. So there is stuff that we could mine from. Um, we've talked about it, but we haven't actually started. I'm not sure why, Bernadette. Do you remember why the, we never went in that direction? Our mandate from the Dean and starting out is try to look at spaces where we can intervene and make a change and we can also take advantage of the freedom that we have, not being, um, not having a client, not having a project that's going on right now to, to be a voice that's not, that is design, has a design approach and is interdisciplinary and so um, I think we certainly should learn from ongoing projects. And so if there are ones that you think we should connect to or can know about, that'd be wonderful. And, and part of it's just our own ignorance. And, you know, when we're sitting in the lab or sitting here, sometimes uh, we have, many of us have worked a lot before. And so we call up our former professional connections and ask them, you know, how much are elevators costing now? <laughs> um, but to be able to engage and to problematize those, I think we'd need um, ideas how. And so that'd be great if you have ideas how. Yeah, I think I think that would be a great idea. There's a lot going on, um, you know, in affordable housing in terms of, you know, getting amenities, empowering people by doing a lot of mixed use projects, you know, in, you know, the, the, the places like churches that are atrophied are now doing mixed use projects where, 
the the tenants or the owners of the apartments now become members of the church you know i mean there's a lot that's going on in a, affordable housing now that one could actually you could actually have a large effect on by just knowing where they're going um and um you know sort of helping to marshal the direction in you know a positive direction but yeah yeah i would love to be a part of and to help in any way that i can um uh, victor it would be great to talk to you about the projects you're doing with the old and new law tenements sure sure yeah of course get your contact info and send you the document we have. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah. We're working on a project now that we're very excited about. It's really it used to be a um, detention center that was demolished. Mm -hmm. And now we're putting up 740 um, units in five buildings. And it's oh, wow. going to have a base, you know, that the base of the building will have grocery stores, banks, you know, job training centers, you know, um, dance studios, um, you know, bakeries, you know, things that empower the community or also have a, a large um, park or a large piazza that the entire development is, is um, focuses on. So the whole idea again is to bring the level of uh, this is new construction, of course, bring the level and the standards of living um, up as much as possible for the residents. Um, so, yeah, and there are lots of other projects in the city that are doing similar things. Um, and then there's this whole issue with this COVID thing, you know, I mean, how does that affect um, racism? How does that affect the tenants who live there? You know, so that's another thing about public health and how that is going to be a major factor in um, affordable housing moving forward, particularly people who don't have the ability to move out of the city because they don't have the resources to to do the, do so at, at this time or at any time. Or the ability to even leave their home in some exactly. cases. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So with this project, we're adding um, a um, you know medical facility so that that would be it's something that would um, help there's a daycare center I mean so the, the, the programming and again the political will is very very important the pro you know I think the city is also put a, a big you know um, has backed this project and so this political will to do that is there you know without the political will you know essentially, and you still find these racist policies that go on in different cities. Um, we talk about places like Seattle, where, you know, the average income is what, about uh, 150,000 or something like that. So that impacts on affordable housing. And because it's impacting on the affordable housing in that area, you get a lot of homelessness if affordable housing is not being built because, you know, developers want to build market rate projects. So how do you, as a housing lab, affect those sort of cities? How do you, as a housing lab, start to bring in social equity that will enable, you know, people who are not dot comers or people who are not, you know, don't work for Facebook or or, or Amazon, how do you allow them to be members of that community without having to push them far to the suburbs and force them to commute to the city, thus continuing that cycle of, you know, um, um, poverty. So I think, I think affordable housing really links to look at the um, economies of state scale when it comes to income you know without you just looking at it just from the design standpoint i think is 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 uh, is a fault i have to leave guys thank you very much this is incredible um i will leave my contact information in the chat but please keep me posted thank we you will reach out yeah thank you, you. All right.
I also have to leave, but thank you everybody who joined and I hope we can continue to have these conversations in the future. Um, not recorded maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, have a great week everyone. Thank you. And speaking for myself, but perhaps for the whole team of the lab, uh, we didn't expect to get these many people today, uh, but we're very grateful for your time and your uh, contributions, both in the chat, in the stickies, in, in the conversation here. Uh, and we're, I think, even more excited to continue working on, on what we're doing, taking into account the very profound questions that were posed today. Yeah, to echo what Juan said too, I think it's brought up for us the big questions that we had in the in the beginning, which was six months ago, nine months ago, not very long ago, about should we try to um, affordable housing and housing for people who have been excluded and don't have money needs money. And should we engage with the big structural issues of unfairness that are there? Should we look at you know what we can do at the margins? Should we look at the unsubsidized space? So I really um, these questions bring us back and are exactly what we needed to be doing right now. Um, so we'll reach out to all of you if you're willing and follow up and really look forward to seeing you at the weekly conversations. Um, I hope and think that they'll be open to alums. Leah Cohen will know more about that um, and we'll continue to try to be as transparent and, and, and um, take advantage of the energy that you all have to, to, to power our own work and make it deeper, harder, more uncomfortable and better. <laughs>